applicable because of how it's being used lately. Most of the time when we come to worship God, when we come together as a body to sing and to pray and to give, to proclaim God's word and to remember the sacrifice of our Savior, we realize that a lot of times there are several people gathered together. And some people have mistakenly thought that this passage of Scripture has something to do with our assemblies. And so it's interesting what I've heard a lot of lately as we are worshiping in our homes and we are being led by a live stream broadcast such as this one. I've heard a lot of people say, well, as long as two or three are gathered together, then everything is good. Well, my question is, if that in fact is what that means, then what happens if only one person has gathered together? What happens regarding a person who is single or widowed, who is alone in their home, and as such, they are worshiping God right now? Are they worshiping Him with us since they don't have two or three? Well, the lesson this morning is not from Matthew 18, but I encourage you to read Matthew 18 sometime because you'll realize that what Matthew 18 is talking about is God's desire for the lost to be found. The entire chapter is filled with the importance of every soul to God. And this particular part is in reference to those who would go and would confront in a loving and kind way someone who has strayed from the truth and needs to come back. But it has nothing to do with worship. However, when it comes to our worship, I think sometimes we make mistakes as well. We make mistakes because right now so many of us are assembling in our homes. Some of us are sitting at kitchen tables watching this maybe on a tablet. Somebody might be sitting uh, on a, in a lazy boy or something uh, looking at it on their phone. Somebody might be lying down on the couch and watching it on the television. There may be some of you who have not even gotten out of bed yet. And so you've turned on the TV maybe at the foot of your bed and you're watching from the comfort of your bed. And so I want us to understand that there may be some misconceptions about worship because we sometimes focus so much on the idea that we need to be in a building in order to do that that we have missed the point about worship altogether. So what we're going to talk about this morning is some of the principles, some of the reminders that need to be brought, brought back to our minds regarding what it means to worship God and what it means for us while we are worshiping Him at home. Let's take a look this morning at three things to remember while worshiping at home. The very first thing that I want us to remember is that we still need to worship. Now that may sound like just about the most redundant statement ever made. Uh, what do we need to remember while worshiping? Well, we need to remember that we still need to be worshiping. But I want you to consider what I'm talking about for just a minute. I want you to consider the meaning behind what I'm saying. There have been a number of uh, good friends, sound gospel preachers who have written things, uh, made video broadcasts uh, about this type of thing. Uh, good friends like Don Blackwell, uh, Steve Higginbotham, David Sproul, others who have recently put out information, be it in written form or by way of video, they put out information reminding us that just because you're not in a building does not mean that your worship stops. In other words, your worship continues. And that's something that I want us to remember uh, and take in, in, to heart. If you've got your Bibles, turn in your Bibles to John chapter 4, verses 19 through 24. John chapter 4, verses 19 through 24. Before all of the coronavirus scare and before all of our live streaming online while so many of us are home, we were going through the book of John and we were just getting ready for chapter 4 and a story that takes place in chapter 4 that we will study and study in greater detail in times to come. But for now, I want us to take our minds to the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well that Jesus came and talked to. Remember that Jesus was a man, he was a woman. There was certainly a major distinction between genders in that day and age, much more so than we see in our country today. Uh, we also see the racism or the prejudice that existed between the Jews and the Samaritans. And so this was an interesting situation where Jesus is talking to this woman. 
And the woman said to him in verse 19 of chapter 4, Sir, I perceive you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Now what was interesting was, and what is connecting us to this point is, that the Samaritan woman wanted to know where they were to worship. Because she was a little confused. Are the Samaritans right on the mountain that they worship on in Samaria? Or were the Jews right by worshiping at the temple in Jerusalem? She wanted to know which is the place that we ought to worship. And the answer was neither as far as God was concerned because those were not the only places that you could worship. Now certainly during the, under the Old Testament and specifically the temple that resided in uh, Jerusalem, God had specific instructions for the people to worship there in certain ways at certain times, but that did not prevent them from worshiping at other times in other ways. And that's true for us today. Somebody might say, well, if we can't meet at the church building, then we can't worship. Why? Because worship takes place only at the church building. Brethren, let me remind you that in the first century, they didn't even have church buildings. When the first Christians came out of Judaism, many of them did not have a place to meet. Many of them met in their homes or met in, as we read, upper rooms, maybe of some other type of structure. But they didn't have church buildings like we have. And so those who come along and assume that we can only worship in something like where I'm standing right now, they're incorrect. Because worshiping takes place wherever the believer is as long as he does it according to God's will. I want you to continue on with me and listen to what Jesus said starting in verse 21. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You're wor you worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such the Father seeks to be his worshipers. Now listen to verse 24, very important. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. You see, we can worship in church buildings, we can worship in our homes. We can even worship in our cars. And I'm not talking about on your way to work in the morning where you sing along to a hymn maybe that you've got playing on the radio. I'm talking about like right now in our present time. There are some places that although they are not meeting together person to person in close proximity, they've literally had drive-in worships where they have come in and, and sometimes the windows are down so they can hear the speakers. Some people have actually gotten a hold of broadcast technology where for no more than about a city block they can broadcast on a particular FM station. And as such, everybody in their cars with their air conditioners on and with the windows rolled up can listen to the preacher, see the preacher. They can see the other people who are participating not only in the leadership roles, but they can even see and wave at through their car windows the people who have assembled in a, such a way to worship God. You see, the key is not where we worship, it's how we worship. And that's given to us in verse 24, that we are to worship in spirit and truth. So what I would suggest to you this morning is what I've heard other people suggest, what advice that I've heard other people give. It's not anything that's original to me. But when you worship from your home, Give the same care and concern for that worship from your house that you do when you come to the building. I'm not necessarily saying that you have to dress up in a suit and tie or you have to dress in a dress in order to worship from your home, seeing that you are probably the only one there. But what I am saying is I've heard some people go so far as to say that's a good idea because it helps you get into a proper mindset. Going to bed the night before and getting a proper night's rest is appropriate for you so that you can be up and you can be alert and you can be ready. Get up early enough so that you can prepare yourself so that you don't have that, that sleepiness that we often have, that drowsiness when we first roll out of bed, but that you've been up long enough to eat breakfast, uh, take your shower,
shower. Get yourself ready so that you are alert and prepared. And then get ready for that broadcast, for that live stream that is going to be presented to you. Because something, that's something you're going to not want to just observe, but you're going to want to be a part of. And you want to be ready for that. So have your Bible out. Have your notebook out. Have your pen uh, out ready to take notes and things like that. Because wherever you are, God expects your best. Wherever you are, God wants your first. And so that's what we want to do. There are some people who have joked with me. They said, when we come back together, how is Kevin going to preach to everybody if they're all still in their lazy boys? If reclining in a lazy boy prevents you from being alert, then put your feet down right now. Bring that back up so that you can lean forward so that you can pay attention. Worshiping God is terribly important. It's not only necessary, but it's necessary that we do it with the right attitude and with the right action. So wherever you are, whether you are in a building somewhere or whether you're in a car or whether you are at home in that lazy boy, remember, we still need to worship and we need to worship according to the way that pleases our Father. Well, let's take a look at a second point this morning. Let's take a look at the second thing that we need to remember when worshiping at home, and that is that we still need to focus. Now, we've talked a little bit about that uh, in the previous point. In other words, we really just don't want to get too comfortable. Like I said, if somebody is lying down in bed watching this live stream, it's very possible that you are going to get tired over a period of time, and that is not a reference to the length of the sermon. What I am saying is it's just very easy to doze off when you're in a position to where you will doze off. And so if you're lying in bed, maybe you want to sit up. If you're sitting in that chair but reclined, maybe you want to move your body forward so that you can pay better attention. But the key is that we don't want to get too comfortable. And furthermore, we don't want to get distracted. Now that's going to be very easy for us to do. Much more so, I believe, than when we come together to worship God in a building such as this. Because when we're here, we expect everyone to kind of be dressed up. And we expect everyone to be quiet at the appropriate time. But that's not the case necessarily in our home. Maybe somebody hollers out something from another room because maybe they're not ready and they're not preparing. And so there is a distraction that is there. Some of you are following along this morning in your, in your Bibles, this part of our worship assembly. And some of you are following along this morning in your Bibles, meaning not the written page, but the electronic page. Now, I use both when I preach, when I teach, and when I sit back and listen to somebody else doing that very same thing. I sometimes use my my Bible with the pages in it. I sometimes use my Bible electronically for various reasons. But there is a little bit of a problem, a little bit of a temptation that may be true when we are dealing with an electronic Bible that we don't deal with with the page format. And that is all of the things that are on that tablet, on that cell phone, on that laptop, on that computer that could be a distraction to us. Let me give you an example. Social media. If you are looking at this live stream on your tablet or other type of social media and it's connected to the Wi-Fi, then you may be getting some kind of alert that pops up or you may get some kind of signal that something's happening. You may get a news alert. Somebody may have posted something to your Facebook page or your Instagram and there's the temptation to go over there and look at that and use that. It's very interesting to me, and I give you this warning right now. It's very interesting to me that when I finish my sermon this morning and a little later on this afternoon when I'm going over all of this live stream information so that I can post it and make sure I, have, I do any kind of changes that are necessary to it, it's very interesting when I go back and I see people who made Facebook posts right in the middle of the sermon. And they didn't have anything to do with the sermon. They're on somebody's page, they're on somebody's social media, and they're making posts, or they're liking something, or they're making a comment or something like that. Put that distraction aside. I realize that you have to have the internet in order to access this live stream, but I also realize you can turn your volume down on your phone. 
you can turn other types of uh, media off during that time so that there is no distraction. Those of you who like to watch the news, and there's a lot of news going on every day regarding the politicians in Washington and the coronavirus and the CDC and other things, if that is your distraction, turn those things off as well. By all means, don't be looking on your laptop at the live stream that we're a part of right now with the TV on in the background. Turn that TV off. Don't text. Do you guys realize that sometimes over the last few weeks, while I have been here preaching a sermon, that I've actually received texts delivered to me during my preaching? I think sometimes people figure out that, or they forget that of what I'm doing and the fact that this is a live broadcast. But over the last few weeks, we've had little problems here and there, technical difficulties. Last week, for instance, on a Sunday morning, when so many people are around the world are live streaming, uh, when on Easter morning, on top of that being a major religious holiday for many in the religious world, and everybody all coming together, the internet here at the church building was very, very slow. And if you were watching on YouTube, then you noticed all those glitches, and I hope that we have solved that problem this morning. But right now, I'm standing in front of three different cameras. I've got one right now that I'm broadcasting with YouTube. I've got another one where I'm broadcasting on Facebook. I've got another one that is video recording the lesson uh, that is not related that we'll upload later just to make sure everybody has access to the best of our ability to what we can. But remember something. Be patient with us. Problems happen. And if they happen and you're on YouTube, switch over to Facebook. If you don't have Facebook, wait a couple of hours and we'll bring the broadcast up for you to watch there. But realize this, that we need to focus and not be distracted. Let me have you consider for something out of a, a passage of Scripture out of Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42 to demonstrate this product. Nobody would argue that cleaning house and take care of guests, taking care of guests and feeding visitors is not important, but there are some things at some times that are more important to that. When Jesus was traveling, he entered a village. We learned from other passages that this is the little village of Bethany. And we read in Luke chapter 10 and verse 38 that a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Mary who was seated at the Lord's feet listening to his word. But Martha was, and the New American Standard says, distracted. Martha was distracted with all her preparations. And she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary. For Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Nothing wrong with entertaining guests. Nothing wrong with being kind and hospitable. But Jesus was there. Jesus was there, and as such, Mary was paying attention while Martha was distracted. I want you to think about us. We talk about what's going on in this live stream. When I come up to the church building on Sunday mornings to get ready for all of this, I've got multiple computers to get ready. I want to get the PowerPoint right. We're trying to do things to make sure that the image behind me is seen and visibly seen uh, as, as much as any of the ones who are leading prayers or leading uh, the songs and things like that. There's a lot to do. And it's very easy for me even to get distracted about what I'm going to preach on because I'm focused on all the minutia to just get ready to preach. Right now, your job as a listener is to make sure that you are not distracted by anything because Jesus is here. God is here. God is in the midst of his family, as he always is. But when we are focusing on him, when we are giving him our praise, our honor, and our glory, we cannot do it by accident. Worship is something that requires deliberate intention. And as such, it requires us to focus, to pay attention, to give diligent attention to what it is that we're doing. Think about that message that is being preached. Think about the words that are being spoken. As you follow along in your Bibles, ensure that those things are in fact true. Consider the, so the words of the songs that are being sung. 
Consider the words of the prayer that's led. And as we partake of the Lord's Supper and our giving, let us make sure that we are focusing on those things and not distracted by anything else that the world might throw our way. Let's take a look at the third thing to remember while worshiping at home, and that is very simply, we still need to participate. Whether you're in a church building or whether you're at home, this sometimes is one of our biggest challenges because we don't realize that we are all participants in our worship. One of the things when we define the word worship, one of the elements of worship that is at the heart of that word is the idea of giving to God a gift. That can be a sacrificial gift. That can be a gift of love. It can be the first fruit out of our abundance. But we need to make sure that we are participating in that. We kind of understand that with singing because we realize we're all expected to sing. We realize that when we're giving and we're partaking of the Lord's Supper because that's something that we come together to do. Sometimes we lose it a little bit uh, when we are led in prayer by somebody else. Our mind may wander, as we talked about. We may lose focus, and so we do not participate the way we ought to. But when the sermon comes along, this one is the one where we seem to really have a, a problem. This is where we seem to really struggle. And the reason is because it's very easy to consider that the preacher or the person delivering the lesson is the one who is participating while the rest of us are simply listening. Simply listening is what I said. And nothing could be further from the truth. You see, I, if you've noticed over the years, I very rarely and only in certain circumstances do I ever try to call the congregation the audience. Because you see, when I think of an audience, I think about television. I think about a movie theater or maybe I think about some Broadway musical. I think about a situation to where someone is up on a stage and they are performing for other people. And they're performing for their pleasure and for their amusement and for their praise and for their accolades. So if the, the movie is good, maybe we'll go back and see it again. If the television show is good, we'll come back each week for the, the next episode in the series. If a Broadway musical is good, we'll brag to our friends and maybe they'll go see it as well. And a lot of times you have the performers and the audience, but that is not the situation when we worship God. The people who are leading the assembly are not performers to the congregation nor is the congregation the audience to those who are leading the assembly. We are all performers as we are lifting our voices in praise, as we are carrying out these acts of worship to God, we are seeking His pleasure. If there is anyone who is an audience, it's God, not us. Well, if we have that misunderstanding that the performers are up here and the audience is sitting in the pews during a normal assembly, how much more is that going to be expressed when we're in homes? Because we watch TV to be entertained. We get on our computers a lot of time to be entertained. Now we're on smartphones and we do so to be entertained. We play games on them and such. And so when we watch somebody else, it's very easy for us to be non-participatory. But brethren, I want to remind you that worship to God is something that is required of all of us in every opportunity that we have. Let me give you some examples of what I'm talking about. And we're going to start with the example in Acts chapter 17 and verse 11. How those Bereans in the first century were participating in the sermons that Paul and others were preaching by making sure that what they were saying was so. Remember that passage of Scripture we started with, Matthew 18 and verse 20, wherever two or three are gathered my name? You see, the reason that so many preachers and elders and teachers have falsely taught that over the years is because they haven't had people who have really been following along with what they're saying and realizing, wait, that verse is out of context. Wait, that verse doesn't mean what it says it means. You're, you're misapplying that. Too often times we sit back passively and things are simply presented to us and then it's done. We need to have active mental communication. 
studying God's Word, being taught God's Word, having the Word of God proclaimed through preaching requires intellect. It requires us to use our brains. In Acts chapter 17 and verse 11, we read that these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, talking about the Bereans, for they received the Word of God with great eagerness, examining the Scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Not only were they excited about this opportunity, just like we have today, not only are we excited to be a part of a time of worship to God, but we want to open up our Bibles, be it the written page or the electronic version. We want to open our Bibles, and we want to examine what is being said. And just because Kevin said it, or just because Don Blackwell said it, or just because Steve Higginbotham said it, or just because David Sproul said it, or whoever does not make it right. The Word of God makes it right. We pray, we hope, this is our constant desire as preachers, that we proclaim the Word of God correctly. But brethren, it's your job to make sure that we're presenting it correctly. Not out of rebellion and not out of ignorance, but we do make mistakes. And that being the case, please examine those scriptures daily. And remember this about prayer in Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 and 6, what Jesus would say in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, when you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, but you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now this is not talking about, because we have multiple illustrations of public prayers in the Bible, but this is not talking about the only time you can pray is in your room, in your closet, or at home as you are right now. But the idea is that when we pray, that we actively pray, that we are not just saying words to be seen, that we're not trying to impress anybody, much less God, but that we talk to God with sincerity of heart, with the proper action, praying to the Father through the Son with the help of the Spirit. That is something that even though somebody else is leading us as we were led earlier in prayer, as we will be led more in several prayers to come, we will be led in those prayers, but each of us need to be meditating on the words that are spoken, meditate on the, on the thoughts that are expressed, the requests that are being made known to God. And if, in fact, those requests are according to the will of God, then those prayers need to be our prayers as well. We don't just let somebody else do the work and we just kind of sit back and wait for it to be over. We are praying together in the same way that we are studying God's Word together. And by the way, we are also singing together. We had a song leader stand up just a minute ago and lead us in singing. But it's kind of interesting when you're in a room full of virtually nobody else. It's kind of hard to lead singing to a computer. It's kind of hard to lead singing to a group of people that you can't actually see, especially when we're so used to coming together to express our joy in song. But that's something we're to do. And I imagine it's equally difficult for you on the other end of this camera when you're watching your TV or watching your laptop or your smart device and somebody else is doing the singing, it may seem kind of strange for you to sing by yourself with that other person or with one or, other, one or two other people in the room. This is where how people sound really come into play. You've heard people who, who it's been said can't carry a tune in a bucket. Well, sometimes it's, if, if you happen to be one of those people that is musically challenged, it's easy to blend in with a congregation of 200 people. But when there's only one other person in the room and you're singing, now you understand what it is to sing from the heart. Because God's not worried about how you sound with your voice. If you're the best singer in the world, or from a musical standpoint, the worst singer in the world, you can still make the melody in your heart that we're taught about. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16 reads, Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. The voice is a nice thing. And I love a cappella singing as much as anybody 
It's beautiful when you have not only hundreds, but if you've ever been in those rare situations where we have thousands of voices blending together in harmony, it's just gorgeous. And I miss that on Sunday mornings. I miss being with a lot of people when we're singing together and we're so enthused about it all. I, I miss that. But I realize that that is a personal desire. That's a personal preference that I don't really have the option to enjoy right now. But again, it's not about my enjoyment. It's about God's enjoyment. And when I sing to him words of praise and glory and honor, when I give him my very best, despite how I sound to somebody else's ear, when I please God, that's what's important. And what's interesting is, both in this passage and in other passages of Scripture, we are taught to speak to one another, to teach one another, to admonish one another. Sometimes that's kind of hard to do when you're the only person in the room. But when other people know that you're praising God, when other people hear that you are worshiping God, when they see that you're going to set this side of time on Sunday morning or on Wednesday night or whenever we have the opportunity to, to give God the glory, that means something to them. That's a lesson that is being taught to them. That's a, a message that's being spoken to them. Even if not directly, it is certainly being spoken directly or indirectly. Now, I do look forward to that day when we can come together. But in the meantime, let's continue to give God our best and worship in spirit and truth. We also need to remember the Lord's Supper. Turn in your Bibles, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I want you to remember that when Paul was addressing the church at Corinth, he talked about the Lord's Supper that was instituted by Jesus with his apostles. Now, Paul was not yet an apostle. He was not there on the night that it was instituted, but this is something that was revealed to him, and he goes ahead and repeats it to the church at Corinth. And he says in verse 23 of 1 Corinthians 11, he says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after the supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now listen to verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Now remember something, the church at Corinth was doing a lot of things incorrectly and partaking of the Lord's Supper was one of the things that they were doing incorrectly. They weren't doing it together. They were making it more an individual memorial, if not an individual meal, rather than a collective memorial. We talk about the Lord's Supper sometimes by using the word communion. And that is because we are communing with God. But the example that we have in Scripture is that we are coming together to commune as well. And again, this is something that I look forward to when I can see this whole building packed full of people who once again want to come together to remember the body and the blood of the Lord. But in the meantime, we are assembling virtually. And in a little bit, we are going to come together before the throne of God and we're going to remember the sacrifice of our Lord. We're going to partake of that unleavened bread. We're going to partake of that fruit of the vine. We are going to remember the sacrifice of Jesus through those emblems. Make sure that you at home are doing this as well. Make sure that you're prepared ahead of time with the Lord's Supper. Remember that we have a lot of portable containers that have both the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine that you can take home and have for weeks to come. Think ahead. Prepare for that avenue of worship that we're going to engage in in just a little bit. Let's make sure that we are truly remembering that great sacrifice. And finally, we take a look at 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2, a passage of Scripture where we see members of the church coming together on the first day of the week to give of their means. We also read in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, the attitude that is associated with that action. We read, Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, 
for God loves a cheerful giver. Now, I realize that we will pass around a collection plate here for the few that are helping me this morning with this worship assembly, but we're not going to be able to come to your house necessarily and pass the plate. But some of you have already prepared for this. Some of you have already sent in your contribution by way of mail. Or maybe you've done something electronically to get it to us. Or maybe you've driven by and slipped it in an envelope through the door so that we can put it in the collection. Remember that giving, giving of our means, giving as we have been prospered, giving with purpose in our hearts, planning in other words, giving upon the first day of the week with a cheerful heart, is something that we find in Scripture that we are to all do. Remember, in all of these avenues of worship, we are not onlookers. We are not a, an audience that's viewing something for entertainment purposes. We are here to participate in the worship of God. So wherever you are, whether you're in a church building, whether you're at home, or as some people have done recently, they've driven to their local Starbucks to pick up on the Wi-Fi, and they sat in their car and worshiped with us from there. Wherever you are, remember, it is mandatory for us to not just be watchers, but participators in this great opportunity to worship our God. I've said it several times. I look forward to the day when we're all back together. My wife is about to go uh, into withdrawals from not being able to hug all of you. But where we are right now can be good too. In fact, I've heard so many people frustrated and upset because we're not assembling together. And that doesn't mean that they don't have a right to, to desire something better. But during this time, give God what you can. Don't worry about what you can't. Don't worry about what the future holds. In God's good time, this too shall pass. But in the meantime, let's take advantage of what we have at our disposal. Let's take advantage of our online streaming. Let's take advantage of looking at articles and, and, and other videos and other sermons and other Bible class lessons that we have at our disposal more now than probably ever before. In just the last few weeks, I have seen so many congregations that had no online presence at all. They've developed a website. Um, they've gotten on social media. They're on YouTube. They're now live streaming in some limited capacity. And those situations may not be the most professionally produced broadcasts in the world, but brethren, that's not what it's all about. What it's all about is our ability in the 21st century to assemble virtually when a pandemic surrounds us and we can still offer God our best and we can still encourage and edify one another. I want to remind you of what we looked at in that very first example from John chapter 4 and verse 24. Jesus said, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. First and foremost, ask yourself, do you desire to be with God? Do you desire to follow God? Do you desire to be saved by God in the end? Then you must be a worshiper of God. But you can't worship just in any way. You must worship in spirit or the proper attitude, and you must worship in truth or in the proper action or way. In other words, if I come together and I sing all the right songs, but I don't give God a second thought as to what I'm singing or what I'm offering to him, then I've offered vain worship. Maybe I come along and, and I uh, have the, the proper attitude, or maybe the reverse of what I just said, uh, proper attitude, proper attitude, proper action, either way. The idea here is that we give God our best in whatever we do. Where are you this morning? And I'm not asking you the question, where are you in a church building, a house, or a car? I'm asking, where are you in your relationship to God? Where are you? Are you in Christ? If not, 
If you're not in the body of Christ, if you're not in the church that Jesus bought with his blood, I'm not talking about some man-made church. I'm not talking about some modern-day religion. I'm talking about the church of the New Testament, the church we read about in God's Word. Are you in Christ? If not, there is no better time than right now to put on Jesus Christ in baptism. I realize, once again, we're separated, but I promise you for that, I'll come to your house. I'll welcome you here at the church building. Right behind this screen is a body of water where we can take you and immerse you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins so that Jesus can take you out of this world and place you into his marvelous light, put you into his kingdom, his body, his church. And through that, you now have the opportunity of eternal salvation. If you haven't put on Christ in baptism, then don't, don't put it off anymore. Take advantage of this opportunity. Make this a priority for you to accomplish today. And if you are a member of the church, if you've done something wrong, then do something right. But doing something right does not make up for the thing that is wrong. It is simply the idea that I'm going to change from doing what is wrong to doing what is right. But I still have to make up. I still have to apologize. I still have to make things right with God. I can't make up for anything as far as paying the price, but I can appeal to God's forgiveness. Having been washed in the blood of the Lamb and with a desire to walk in the light as He is in the light, I have the ability to go to my God and confess my sins to Him, and He is just and He is faithful to forgive me. I can also go to others. I don't have to go to them in person. In this day and age, I can call them, I can email them, I can text them. I can do whatever is necessary to reach out to them and let them know I have wronged you and I'm sorry. Or I have not been the best example and I'm going to strive to do better. But please forgive me. If you have that need, take advantage of that in the way that best suits you this morning. And if you are a, somebody that just simply needs prayers, I realize that we're not in a situation where you can walk forward during the singing of this next song and sit on the front pew and we can then maybe have a prayer with you together. But I promise you, if you'll make your wishes known, we will share with others in prayer our desire that is your desire to be better equipped to walk through this life with Jesus and live with him forever one day. While we are at home, Let's worship God. While we're prevented from worshiping together in person, let's make it a priority to worship together in ways such as these. Let's give God our best. Let's look out for others. And let's make sure that we never forget who we are and whose we are during these difficult times. If there is some way that God can help you this morning, if there's some way we can help you this morning, let us know while we sing this invitation song.